Hello, and welcome to a conversation with Russ Dobler. This video is part of my interview series with science communicators and skeptical activists for my Skeptical Inquirer online column. Today, my guest is Ross Dobler, who, among other things, is the president of the New York City Skeptics and the editor of the science section of AIPT.com. Welcome, Ross. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for asking me to do this. Two quick corrections, because we do care about the truth here. You asked me, and you still got it wrong. It's Dobler, not Dobler. I, not that I did. I really uh... And AIPT.com is actually some weird Chinese site who won't sell us the rights. So we are AIPTcomics.com. Okay. You know, every time I write that, I do it wrong. <laughs> and AIPT we, would, Comics, we would love for it to be simple, but China, you know, they're and just screwing I, And everybody. AIPT Comics, no no underscore anything in between when you, when you Google it? That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. So what is AIPT Comics? Dot com, right? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Uh, it started as a blog, mostly about comics. Um, geez, I probably early teens, uh, something like that. Yeah, uh, maybe even earlier than that, uh, by two friends in uh, Boston. Uh, I'm actually located in New York, as you know, I'm president of the New York City Skeptics. Um, and they, uh, it kind of grew over time. Uh, you know, they were reviewing comics, just talking about uh, whatever pop culture stuff they were interested in. And eventually they started reviewing more and more comics and the publishers started to take notice and said, hey, we'll send you early copies if you want to review these. And then people came in who wanted to do movie stuff. And at one point somebody reached out to me because I had started a blog about uh, science kind of um i was a little upset with the quality of science journalism and as you might expect skeptical journalism too so this so was I, your own personal blog yeah yeah and i had um i just happened to write one about superheroes the science of super healing or something like that and um, i had it in my signature on an old school comic book message board and one of them saw me and said hey would you like to come write science stuff for us and i said sure why not I actually did have to think about it for a second because I was like, Ugh, you know, do I want to be pigeonholed as the comic book guy? It's like, you know, I like mm. comics, but like, I'd like to get more of a serious audience, you know? And then I was like, you know what? These <laughs> kind of like getting this stuff in front of people who aren't expecting it, that might be a pretty good tactic. Um, so most of AIPT is still just comics and movies and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, I got to know the guys pretty well. I used to live in Boston before when they were much younger, probably too young to go to the bar with me. Um, and but I have been out there since and hung out with them and they're great guys. So they give me my own little corner. They believe in what we do. They believe in uh, skepticism, believe it or not, once I kind of told them what it was. <laughs> so, and, and, that, uh, and that corner is AIPT science, as you call it, right? Yes. So we yeah. all have like all the different kind of sections have their own like social media handles. So there's AIPT movies and I'm AIPT science, which I figured was just a little more like you call it AIP. Well, first I did mostly science and then I was like, oh, we could really move more into skepticism and still find good topics. But like nobody really knows what skepticism is. So I'm like, well, we'll call it science and get people to click on it. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, part of, you know, skepticism is science communication. Part of it is critical thinking communication. So that makes sense. And it yeah, it, it, as we have discussed uh, before, you know, and other people have, the word skeptic has gotten a bad rap because like, hey, there are climate skeptics and Holocaust yeah. skeptics. And so it's it does the word doesn't only have one meaning, and that's a problem. Especially lately. Um, but that's, a, that's probably another topic. But yeah, yeah it, and if, like, when I started it, uh, it was more of an issue of nobody knew what skepticism was, so they weren't going to click on it. And now it's more like, well, I don't pe want people to think I'm promoting conspiracy theories so right, right, right right yeah i've heard the problem of people actually being uh concerned about carrying around a skeptical inquire article with bigfoot on the cover you know because it's debunking that or investigating why we don't think that's real but still it looks like hey you believe in bigfoot you know you're carrying that around you see that's see that's where i differ because if you actually go to aiptcomics.com right now and you click on the science drop down menu you're going to see something that says reality check which you might be able to figure out what that is. It's science yeah. of movies and whatever else. But then 
the next three categories are UFOs, conspiracy theories, and cryptids. And despite what I said about not wanting people to think I'm promoting conspiracy theories, the average person is interested in that sort of yeah. thing. And so they click on the drop down. Yeah. yeah, whether they believe it or not, it, it might just be a fun thing to think about to them. So you click on that, and all of a sudden, there's all this skeptical material about conspiracy, conspiracy theories. And you might not even realize it's skeptical until you click on an article, and then I've got you. Right. I, I've heard you use the word skepcom, I think, instead of psycom. That, that's yeah, it's say. something I was kind of uh, trying to play with. Um, didn't really, uh, I haven't like brought it to the greater community yet to say, hey, this is something we should get behind. But I think we have, a. after the climate deniers really came out at the beginning of the 21st century or around then, I think scientists really figured out that like, so a lot of scientists were very hesitant to do science communication for a long time. Carl Sagan got excoriated because people would say, like, why are you doing this? Who cares what the public thinks? Just do your work. But then when you had climate deniers, anti-vax people, scientists started to figure out, we need to, if not control our message, at least explain things to the public before somebody else does it in a bad way and takes advantage of that. So now most PhD programs will have a SciComm component, which was unheard of 30 years ago. And I think we might have a little bit of an issue with that, because if we were a science, we have our journals like Skeptical Inquirer, Skeptic Magazine, all things like that. You do your research, you publish your research in the journal, and people like us see it. But I don't think the average person who wants who is thinking about Bigfoot is picking up Skeptical Inquirer off the uh, absolutely stand. not they're a member of a bigfoot hunting team and group and they're in a bubble and they only look at stuff that promotes bigfoot as a real thing exactly so just yeah. like there's psychom i think there needs to be a greater effort even if not from the researchers from somebody of skepcom getting that good information that all the researchers do out to the people who really need to see it yeah yeah and 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 this is by the way the, precisely the reason i have you on now so uh, AIPT science was on my mind last week because I was writing an article for you. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to promote the website this week. Um, I, I, as you said, I think it's very important to reach out to people outside the choir because um, they're not going to be picking up skeptical inquiry or any of those. They're probably not going to watch the videos on CFI. Yeah. Because they have, so because tough. even even if you, you, you got people who, who believe in something or people who don't have an opinion either way. The believers are certainly never going to seek out skeptical media because they already have an image in their mind, whether you call it skepticism or whatever you want to call it. They already have an image in their mind of the debunker who just wants to poo-poo everything and doesn't right. even look at the evidence. Um, you know, that's I think that's a largely undeserved uh, characterization. I think a lot of skeptics actually do good investigation. They don't come in with a preconceived notion, but you know, that's the, when I was a kid, I believed in UFOs and I had that beaten into me by the oh, UFO media. My God, yeah. They were like, oh, these terrible debunkers like Phil Class. And then I started to read, read Phil Class and I'm like, well, wait a minute. He's kind of making sense. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'm old enough where there wasn't an internet and I only found out about UFOs from a, a book. It might've been, been in the science section about somebody who claimed that they had met all these extraterrestrial uh, species and, and had sketches of the beings and their spacecraft from each planet. I was just, eat, you know, eating it up. What? Why isn't this on the news? Look, it's in the library. This is true. Yeah. No, I had a very similar. I believed all that stuff. And, you know, just to name drop the man again, uh, picked up a copy of Cosmos when I was like 14 or so. And I was just trying to figure out because I had I'd been reading the UFO books. And I was like, once I heard like a good skeptical argument, believe it or not, from Jacques Vallée, of all people, who was talking about um, a underground alien bases. He, he said to the believers of the underground alien bases, well, who takes out the garbage? And they were like, <laughs> and they were like, that and they were like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you're talking about like giant multiple acre underground sites. It's going to produce a lot of waste. Where does it all go? Somebody would see it. And like, now, you know, playing the skeptic, maybe they use that material in the sure. confusion and for their energy. So, but at the same time, it made me think, like, well, hold on, why did right. I never think right. of that question? Right. And and then when I started getting more into science, I would read Sagan and other things, and I'd be like, oh, these are the kinds of questions you need to ask. And oh, eyewitness testimony, maybe not the best after all. So. I've heard you say something like, um, let's not kill the fun when we're discussing sci-fi and picking it apart, uh, you know, sci-fi and other fiction, but like we can use lessons to do that to also show that science is fun. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, that's why I, that's the thing. It's like, especially now when pretty much everything is entertainment, you know, like uh, there's so much competition for eyeballs. There's so much competition for people's attention. If you come down negatively or you're perceived as being negative, people just aren't going to want to listen to you because they have a million other things that will please them. Um, so yeah, and th that's the important thing. And that's why just to kind of promote your article, uh, you uh, you wrote something for me that will probably be already live by the time you see this um, wow. uh, about Havana syndrome, which you've talked a lot about and um, dancing panics and things like that. And you related, I'll spoil it here. You related to that episode of what was it? Subspace Rhaps Rhapsody from yeah, Strange this, New Worlds. Star Wars. Trek, uh, Strange New World, Subspace Rhapsody. Which I just thought was brilliant. And you weren't <laughs> out there saying, and you weren't out there saying, well, this could never happen in real life. You were saying, hey, this is a fun episode. Let's think about how this could have really happened. Right. I like I like the, the general take in, in all the articles I see there. Um, so so what are some of your favorite articles? Not including mine, of course. You're not. The only <laughs> yeah, I, I've had seven previous. This will be number eight, I think. Well, um, just to go back to comic books, um, there was a comic series that just recently ended called um, Department of Truth, written by a guy named James Tyne in the fourth. I think he. He's won writing awards. I believe the, the comic won the Eisner one year, which is basically the Oscars for comic books. Um, and I've talked to him a lot and he uh, he is very much on the wavelength of a lot of us. Like we, he grew up believing this stuff and having a good time with it. And now he's very skeptical and especially realizes the dangers of conspiracy theories. So much so that this book was all about if if enough people believe a certain conspiracy theory, it becomes real, which is a little on the nose, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but, uh, and I know, so basically every conspiracy theory that he's talked about in the book, I was able to get somebody to write about in a skeptical manner, like basically anything you can imagine, like even it's, uh, you know, cryptids, but like obscure things like the phantom time hypothesis, uh, serious stuff like Sandy Hook. How, how long ago was that? Uh, the series ended sometime last year, but if you uh, go not, to, uh, if I'm you go to, I'm a little it, sad because I just heard one today, which you know, the series has ended. So they can't be, it's the whole Taylor Swift and the chiefs. And that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about skepticism month in a second, but uh, if anybody would like to write about Taylor Swift conspiracy theories, I would love to publish that article. <laughs> I was going to write you before. Has anyone written that? But I guess not. No, but it's, so hey, it's your prime. Chance, let's get it up before the Super Bowl, baby. Come on, let's do it. So so this is one of the other reasons I want I wanted to publicize this, because I know you're always looking for new writers and it's a great way. Like You don't have to be a professional writer to do this, right? No, absolutely not. In fact, uh, well, I'll preface it by saying uh, I take I took some journalism classes because I was kind of not satisfied with my real job and thought about transitioning to journalism. And like I said, you know, science journalism isn't always good. And I thought maybe I can help make it better. And then once I finished my classes, I was like, oh, shit, nobody's getting jobs anymore. What am I? What? This ain't going to work. So that's when I was like, you know what? Let me just concentrate on this pop culture stuff. It's what I'm good at. It's what I know. And. I was like, let me see how many articles. Let me see if I can do like an article or two a week. And then I was like, well, that's a lot of writing. Let me see if I can reach out and get more people. And at this point, I've gotten like 80 or 90. I'd have to count up oh, since 2017. 80 or 90 different people have written for me. Wow, and a couple that's of them, I would have never have guessed it was that. And, that. and that goes from professionals like Ben Radford. Maybe you've heard of him. To... Uh, a friend of mine from college to uh, someone I knew in high school who I don't think I've seen since high school and I'm an old man now. They're going to have some articles coming up, uh, especially my high school friend is uh, she knows a hairdresser uh, where she uh, where she lives, who is helping with um, actual human trafficking victims. And she really wanted to write about that in contrast to uh, what is that terrible movie? Sound of Freedom. Oh, yeah. And QAnon's fantasy trafficking victims. So so have you had somebody publish? Have you published an article by somebody who had never written for anything before? Yeah. Like I said, th there's two of them right there. Most people I have had. Uh, I, I discovered at some point that I'm much 
more enjoy editing and helping other people craft their voices than I do actually writing. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it's the critic in me. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have never written before. I had somebody, um, a friend of JD Sword, who actually write, also writes for Skeptical Inquirer website. Uh, okay, he came up to me after I talked to Kenny Biddle once, and he said, "Like, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. Um, can I write something for you? I'm kind of thinking about doing it, and 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 how would I do it?" And I was like, "I'll tell you." <laughs> That's great. Where there's a will, there's a way. Let, let me let me read for you because um, uh, the New York City Skeptics is going to be hosting Daniel Loxton to talk about where do we go from here. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the name of a 2007 essay that he wrote quite a long time ago. So we're going to get an update on that. But I actually read it today and I, and I took one paragraph out of this. Pertinent to new people. He said, we need everybody, young people, fledgling activists, the silent outrage, those who don't know where to start to stand up and be counted. There is burden enough to go around, meaning to um, look into these paranormal and supernatural claims, conspiratorial claims. Even our heroes need students, helpers, even one day heirs. I love that. Yeah, it's very true. And, um, you know, a little off topic, but uh, I actually talked to Daniel a little bit as a preface of the talk we're going to do in a few days, which by the time you see this, you will probably be able to uh, go to New York City Skeptics on the YouTube page and view it, I would hope. Um, and we talked a little bit about um, kind of like people who don't self-identify as skeptics. Um, there's a lot of them out there and they use kind of terms like they do misinformation or disinformation research. And uh, if you actually go and check out YouTube and, uh, and Google things like skepticism versus uh, misinformation or disinformation, skepticism comes up with a lot of atheist topics these days. Um, and uh, misinformation comes up with what I think we would call classical uh, skeptical topics. Okay, so so regarding your editing philosophy, and this is like, again, for new people to understand this, um, I've been writing for a long time. I have no writing training at all, but it's interesting in that I submit my articles, at least four other publications over the years. No one has changed the word. When I submit them to you, the average- I tear that shit apart. You do. A <laughs> hundred words, paragraphs get wiped out. It's a, it's a start. So what's your editing philosophy? And, and, I, and I think I'm saying this partly because if somebody doesn't feel they're a great writer, you will patch it up. Yeah, because, well, here's what journalism really taught me. There's a reason journalism has existed more or less in its current form for 100 years, 150, 200 years, whatever it's been, because it works. And um, and it works because you it, you start with a narrative and you want a narrative flow to go throughout the whole thing. The next thing leads to the next thing leads to the next thing. And if you can make a human connection, that's that's what's going to get people continue reading, which is even more important now uh, when I believe the page retention rate on any website is about the average is about one second. People will click say if that, if that's what they want to look at or not click away and that's it you want to keep people on that page for as long you want to give them you want to not give them an excuse to click away you got to hook them immediately and get them to read the whole thing if you really want to get that information across and a lot of that is again building a narrative and um also silly things like search engine optimization anything over a thousand words gets pushed down on google results um you got to repeat certain words whatever word you really want to resonate and things like that and a lot of what i do is when you say like you know your articles end up with 100 or 200 or less words part of that is to get closer to that thousand part of it is just cutting out like filler words that you know if you see a lot of buts or whatevers or things that don't really need to be there, that is something that I cut out a hundred times in everybody's articles. Um, those are the kinds of things that kind of slow down the flow and, you know, just the average person reading it. If it gets, if the text gets clunky, they'll be like, I'm done reading this. I'm going to go do something else. So anything you can do just to smooth it out, tighten it up. It really helps. So the bottom line for any uh, newbies out there who want to use this as an opportunity to get published for the first time, you just 
Just listen to all that. Like you have nothing to worry about. Russ will yeah. make it perfect. Speaking of Radford, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to publish a, a great article by him on the Chupacabra recently. Uh, he just sent it to me. It's going to get published very soon. Um, he sent me a 3000 word article. I cut it in half. I'm like, dude, I can't do this. I'm like, dude, I can't do this. They're not going to let me do this. <laughs> so how important are pictures? Because I noticed that you always have interesting pictures you add to my articles. Yeah. I mean, you definitely need to have something. And um, another one of the, again, one of those SEO tricks is that if you want somebody to, to, uh, one of the things about SEO on a site like this is you want to pick the search term that you want people to be searching when they find your article. And I'll tell you right now, we, uh, I told you, I hated, well, I didn't tell you, I'll tell you right now. I hated your original headline for your Star Trek and Havana syndrome. Article. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's horses, not unicorns. <laughs> yes. What the hell does that mean, Rob? I mean, I know what it means, but somebody looking at that, what are they going to see? So I wanted to get a mass psychogenic illness in there. But at the same time, I was like, okay, if somebody's searching mass psychogenic illness, this is a very broad overview. They, they should probably go somewhere else that's going to have more details. What I want is for someone who's searching for Star Trek Strange New Worlds to find this article and be like, mass brilliant. psychogenic, mass psychogenic illness. What the hell is that? Yeah. Click on it. Boom. You're suckered in. Right. So, so the title you will have to uh, search for or go right to AAPT is, uh, I think you said, uh, were the crew of strange new worlds affected by mass psychogenic illness? Something, Something like that. that. Yeah. I think yeah. it's going to yeah. publish, uh, yeah. if not Thursday, the first of uh, Friday, the second, I think. Of February, 2024. We're talking Correct. about for people who look at this in the future, it'll be out there. So, okay. So now, just like they do in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is covered by AIPT, by the way, uh, let's learn a bit about your own origin story. So what what's your background? Did you have a religious background? Were you a paranormal believer uh, in, in a large part? You mentioned a few things, UFOs. Yeah. No, my I, I mean, I was, <laughs> I, I, I grew up without any religion. Um, but yeah, like I, I must have thought Ghostbusters were do was a documentary because I, I so love that. So that was your thing? Was that I love, thing I love that movie Ghost? and Ghosts were the, was the first thing I was really interested in and big believer, you know. And But then, like, I kind of moved into UFOs because so that seemed somehow more serious to me. I, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I loved all that stuff. And I still do, like cryptids. And, that, you know, that's why those are the kinds of things that get published a lot on AIPT because those are the things that I'm interested in. Um but like I said, yeah, at some point it was a revelation to me, uh, no pun intended, because I think it was in the book Revelations by Jacques Vallée, where he said that thing. And um, I was like, yeah, this isn't like uh, there's something I'm not understanding here. And that's when I got more into science. And it was a long, protracted process of um, going from belief to the null hypothesis of maybe this isn't true and let's wait for the evidence so this would instead of just being a one of uh, in the marvel universe this would be a multi-movie sequence to get you to become a skeptic yeah i mean it would be a boring ass movie because i was kind of a loser <laughs> then but so what uh so what did you major in when you actually uh decided uh, to do real uh real science yeah well that was the thing it was like i wanted to do science and and once I got the science bug, I got interested in a lot of different things. I ended up doing geophysics, um, which is basically science of the earth, like seismology. I, so I, did I don't think I've seismology. ever heard that term. It, yeah. I've heard geology and physics, of course, different. Yeah, topics. it's like like internal earth stuff. Like, uh, like, like I said, I did a lot of seismology, but it also encompasses volcanology and stuff like that. Inner earth movements and things of that nature. Um but yeah, and I honestly, I probably shouldn't have. Uh, well, I tell you a story. Uh, when I went to my geology department, my future geology department, when I was just, um, you know, signing up to go to Geneseo, uh, my, I guess, advisor or my future advisor looked at my SAT scores and then looked back at me and said, you still want to do science? Uh, <laughs> my SAT scores were good. Both my verbal and my math were good. But my math was like good up here. And my verbal was like good up here. <laughs> That's weird. Well, I mean, in the long run, he turned out to be great. He turned out to be right because I ended up washing out of science. I went to grad, I went to grad school and didn't finish my master's. 
for a variety of reasons. One of them being, I don't think my mathematical aptitude was really high enough and that I was lazy and drinking too much. But, uh, <laughs> but honestly, I think it all worked out because um, that background in what science is and how to do it. And even just the knowledge of how, of where physics is at this point in time, you know, our general understanding of it, that, you know, now that I, now I can use my words, which I'm much better with to bring that understanding to, to other people. So, you know, no regrets. The other thing you're involved with, I, I mentioned it in, in the uh, introduction is a New York city skeptics. How'd you get involved with that? And you rose to the rank of president. So yeah, like, well, actually, that? if you go to AIPTcomics.com and uh, search for James Randi, you'll see an article uh, that I wrote when he died, I believe it was. Um, and this is, again, where people need to understand how important connecting is and how important the narrative is. Why do you like James Randi? I'll tell you why you like James Randi, because he told great stories. And I went to, I didn't even know, I moved to the New York City area in like 2006. And I didn't even know there was a local group for a long time. And then in 2012, I heard of that Nexus, which was, you know, the, our big... Uh, our uh, big Northeast big Conference on Science, Science and, and skepticism. skepticism. Kind of like uh, our SciCon analog uh, here on the East Coast. And um, I saw Randy and I was like, oh, I read one of his books. And I was like, ah, shit, I should go to that, like... You know, dude was old. He's not going to be. Of course, he ended up living much longer than that, even. And yeah, this is 2012. Um, but hell, I was like, yeah, I need to go see Randy while I had the chance. And um, I think it's I'm pretty sure if it's pretty sure it's on the Nexus YouTube. If you go to it, he gave this great talk uh, largely about Peter Popov. And of course, a terrible story. He was the faith healer who had the earpiece and his wife would tell him all the ailments of the people. And um, and also, uh, hello, and also PD. And, hello, PD. If you're not hearing me, you're going to exactly. be in trouble tonight. Exactly. And also, yeah. like randomly racist things for no apparent reason about people in the audience. And Randy, again, the master storyteller, the master performer that he was, he stood up there and he would talk in this very low tone, this very soft voice about these things. And and like when he said the, the most horrible thing he, he would say the most horrible thing that was said on the earpiece to last and then he would pause and say and then he yelled what kinds of people are these and he just went on he talked about like the desperation of the people in the audience and how they would come and these people pop off and his minions they didn't care they just wanted to fleece them and take their money and that's when i stood there and i was like you know what what am I doing with my life? I got a, I got a decent job. I got everything taken care of for the most part. I need to do, tr do something. I need to try to get involved and make something happen because I don't know if I could live with myself if I didn't. Wow. I had not heard this story. Very interesting. So yeah, so was, the point was like, how did you get become president of, of that organization? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was just like I started hanging around, and until they they had to do something with me, uh, you know, I just started doing little things like, hey, you know, I'll I'll take care of the emails or whatever, and then like I would, I would uh, when we had talks, I would like write a little report of the talk and like say, hey, do you want to po post 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 this on your website? You know, I take it, it's free, and um, eventually they figured out like. Oh yeah, this guy actually gives a shit, and uh, <laughs> you know I just kind of wormed my way in, and then eventually, and then eventually everyone was like, "Well, I don't want to be president." Well, I don't want to be president, and I'm like, eh, "I'll do it." Yeah, you were president, I believe, when I gave a talk there, my first skeptical talk ever, and it was a thing that you guys invented. I don't know if I've seen it replicate anywhere called Speedy Camp. Yeah, I think it was the first, the only time we've ever done that, actually. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if anyone else is. I, I like the idea. That was a, a shorter version of the Skeptic Camp. So you had to give the talk, I think it was 10 minutes, mm -hmm. which was tough. Uh, and Mitch Lampert, uh, you know, ran the thing, and it was very good. I remember you gave a talk, maybe astrology, something like that. Yep, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that was my first, my first talk ever, my first time getting up on a stage talking to a skeptical group. It was... It it was my little foot in the door there, and uh, actually that led me to talking at Psycon that year, which is like really there weird. You go. You're welcome. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, so, and what's your involvement with uh, Nexus? Uh, well, Nexus is kind of on pause right now. Uh, we there wasn't one this uh, past year in 2023. Being losing track of the years. Um, uh, sort of when the pandemic, the SGU guys kind of. It was a collaboration between SGU 
and Ness, nor you know the 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 general group that hosts uh, SGU Skeptics Guide to the Universe, and um, they kind of took it more internally because they wanted to do a uh, an online thing, obviously during the pandemic and shortly after the pandemic. So they were clearly more versed with that. Um, and then they did the uh, in-person thing uh, in the New York City area that was uh, this past year that was less of a conference and more of just a hangout, which I think a lot of people enjoyed. Um, so we'll see what happens going forward. Okay. I think, it's, I think the future is undetermined in that, in that area. Yeah, that was called not a con, as I recall. That was I believe that's correct. Yes. Interesting name. And I might have gone to it, except it was too close to the conference I had just come back from which was <laughs> in Las Vegas. And so you, you, you've mentioned people who've written for Skeptical Inquirer. Have you written for Skeptical Inquirer, right? So, several articles, as I recall. Correct. But then again, we get back to the laziness. Um, so yeah. I, haven't, <laughs> uh, I haven't done much uh, recently. I, I, knew, I do need to get back to it because I do have a, th a couple of things on my mind that are more suited uh, to that location. I actually just went to um, the Sasquatch Calling Festival in Whitehall, New York, which is about in half an hour south of where I grew up. Believe but what, what does that mean, calling festival? That's a good question. <laughs> um, oh, like bird calls? So that yeah, like, they try to yeah. make the sound so they think it's going to attract? A, oh, my There God. was a Bigfoot encounter there in the late 70s. <clears throat> and part of the story was that the gentleman who was a police officer who um, encountered the thing had a great description of this beastly growl and howl that the thing had mm. so um they they bring people in and um try to mimic it and like they give a prize for the best sasquatch call <laughs> and um <laughs> it's very it's very kitschy i mean it's very okay. but it's uh it's one of those things where it's like i i think and this is a, a different topic but i think cryptozoology is waning and i think that kind of stuff is going more into folklore and fewer and fewer people are even considering that those things might be real. And it's just a fun story. And it's just a fun local tradition. Like they've had that festival three or four years now, and it's bigger every year. And let me tell you, Whitehall, New York, in the middle of the state, upstate, not a very prosperous place. And that's not coming down on them. It's just the way it is. So if they can get a little bit of cash infusion and have fun with Bigfoot, I don't think that's the worst thing. So are, are you saying this is kind of like Puxatani Phil, which I don't think anybody believes he actually predicts the weather, but it's like a big thing for that? There were definitely some believers there, but I would, if I had to guess at the percentage, hardcore believers, I mean, like a quarter of the people there, you know. So I, I know that uh, Kenny Biddle, uh, the uh, chief investigator for CSI, goes to paranormal conferences and things because that's where he got to start on the other side of it, believing those things. And he he, he does great talking to the other side. Have you ever have you ever done that? To uh, uh, very little, uh, it, especially there, I was I kind of put myself in that reporter role given my journalism background. I just kind of wanted to take it all in, and I did ask some questions too. They they had talks believe it or not they had a little stage where they had a few people uh like different bigfoot quote-unquote experts um and um so i did ask them some questions to just kind of pick their brains about things um but yeah i mean like i said especially that one in particular i was just there to observe um yeah i, I don't know if i'm the most confrontation confrontational person that's why maybe that's why i write instead of doing videos it's tremendous that kenny does that and yeah. it's 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 the Lord's work in a way, because like it's, I'm sure it's very thankless. And he take, you know, I, mean, I know for a fact he takes a lot of crap, but in my head, I, I, my, in my thoughts, I'm like, well, let's be practical. How can I do the most? I'm only here for a short time, right? Like, how can I do the most good? And am I going to convert this guy who's believed in ghosts and made it his identity and his weekend activity every weekend? Or can I kind of hit people who don't have, don't have a solid opinion yet? Right. Um, but like right. I said, it's it's awesome that Kenny does it and I love him for doing it, but I'm not going to do it. I don't have it in me. <laughs> it's not my thing either. <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts on other ways to reach beyond the choir? I have to bring up real skeptics here. You yeah, know. well, that's the obvious and the best one. I mean, and I've told you and Susan this many times. I mean, my whole thing and I'm kind of speaking as Daniel recently and the more I think about it, I'm trying to refine the not even the elevator pitch, the one sentence pitch and the one sentence pitch that I'm coming up with today before we had this talk was go where the people are. 
you can't just assume that the average person, again, with all the entertainment options and everything vying for our attention, is going to seek out the best information. They're going to go to whatever is accessible. They're going to go to the YouTube videos that they're watching. They're going to go to their friends. So put your information where the people are. Wikipedia is the is that's usually the number one place that people go. So yes, that's that's where the information needs to be, and it needs to be in other venues where people already have their eyeballs. Okay, Ross, I think that's a good place to end our talk. What's the best place for people to contact you to find out about uh, submitting something to AIPT, perhaps? Um, you can, uh, I guess the best way, there actually is a contact form on AIPTcomics.com um, where, uh, you know, if you just address it to me, it'll get to me eventually. Or you can tag me on Twitter. I'm still going to call it Twitter because why not? Uh, you could tag at AIPT Science on Twitter or DM. I believe the DMs are open. I'm not positive. You may need to follow and then DM. But like I said, if you don't want to do that, you can go to the contact form on AIPTcomics.com or and just come by and check things out because in every day in February, we are posting a new article, one of them by Rob Palmer, uh, that is about skepticism in pop culture or skepticism of pop culture, which I think is just important. Yes, it's a fantastic idea, and I'm glad to see you keep that going every year. All right, thanks again, Russ. It was a blast. Well, thank you, Rob. I appreciate it.